Good morning, everybody. How does the audio sound? Are we good? Okay. So once again, my name is Nate Freeland. Uh, this is a little bit about me. I went to undergraduate at Virginia Military Institute and uh, did my medical training at uh, MCV in Richmond, Virginia. I worked for two years uh, with the Richmond Ambulance Authority as a uh, EMT basic, basically the, the driver of the squad. Uh, it was a pretty crazy place, lots of trauma. Um, then I came out here to Utah and I did three years of neurosurgery. Um, couldn't find a picture that was truly representative of that experience. Unfortunately, I switched to uh, emergency medicine and it's been a very enjoyable experience. This is the metaphorical resonance of neurosurgery, I think, and that is the residency. But I think this slide is pretty representative of not all pain is gain. <laughs> so a um, couple things that I'll cover today, just how important is head injury? What can we do to try to prevent it? What can we do to um, improve the outcomes from it? What are the etiologies? Um, I'll go over a number of definitions, uh, just standard, nom standard nomenclature, just so that everybody is speaking the same language. Um, how we grade the severity of brain injuries uh, using the Glasgow Coma Score, um, some physical exam findings, and the management of various severities of brain injury. So, <clears throat> what's the big deal? It's, uh, it's a very prominent problem. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that should be pretty easy. <clears throat> Yeah, I was a little worried about that when I first saw it. That's any better? Okay. Should we just pick it up from here? Are you still are you still taping? Okay. All right. So, as I was saying, what's the big deal? Uh, it's a very common problem. Uh, greater than 1.5 million a year uh, visit the emergency departments uh, due to head injuries. Now these are a varying degree of severity. Um, the actual number in two, 2003 was uh, a little more than 1.5 million and I presume, and I haven't seen the most recent data, but I presume that it's gradually, uh, progressively increasing. Over 50,000 people die every year because of head injuries. Um, I found that this was very interesting. It doesn't say necessarily that these people die from their head injuries, but 90% of those who don't make it from the trauma scene have a concomitant head injury. Um, there certainly could be other uh, comorbid factors that were going on. Um, it's a major cause of long-term disability. Uh, somewhere between 80 and 90,000 people a year are disabled for the rest of their life because of their head injury. Uh, and I'll get more into this in a minute, but most commonly from falls and motor vehicle crashes. And it's the number one cause of childhood death. This is a recent um, publication by ASEP 
Um, the president of ASAP, Dr. Angela Gardner, uh, released this statement on the 4th of May, uh, stating how important helmets are. Uh, there's been a number of things in the past that says, you know, the skull is pretty effective at what it does. Well, the helmet can, can help out quite a bit. And according to this publication, uh, in which they use National Highway Transportation Safety Administration data. Uh, they state that bicycle helmets are nearly 90% effective in preventing head injuries. Um, if used correctly, they can prevent up to 45,000 head injuries a year. Um, <clears throat> half a million bicyclists uh, present to the emergency department or some sort of emergency care each year uh, that are not wearing helmets and 67,000 of those. Um, oh, that doesn't make sense. But 27,000 of those are serious enough to have to be brought into the hospital. They also comment a little bit about uh, motorcycle helmets, and they presume that it saves um, about 1,800 people in the, in the year of 2008. Um, so, you know, this is a, a very... Big problem, there are a number of states in the country, specifically Utah, that uh, do not require a helmet law. And uh, personally, I'm not one to advocate that the government needs to tell everybody what to do, but this is the number one facet of prevention. If you can prevent the head injury from occurring in the first place, you prevent all of these long-term outcome problems. But So if we can't prevent it, what do we do? Um, I'm going to cover real quick the basic management in the field, and you know I've had two years of field experience, and I'm not going to um, um, basically tell EMS how to do their job, but I'm just going to cover a few things uh, that, in the in the long run, turn out to be uh, very effective. So the ABCDs of ATLS, um, but adequate oxygenation, blood pressure maintenance, and stop the bleeding. Let's go ahead and cover that. So with hypoxia and hypotension in the setting of a brain injury, the mortality is 75%. So if you can prevent both of these two uh, facets, then the patient is going to do much better in the long run. So if they're hypoxic, obviously you go through your standard protocols, place them on a pulse ox. If they need airway support, you do it. If they need breathing support, you do that. Bag valve mask is very effective. In most situations, you don't need to intubate somebody, um, especially if it's going to take time in the field to do that before they can get to definitive care, uh, before they can get to the operating room to have this brain bleed removed or whatever the problem is. Um, check their blood pressure pretty regularly. Uh, every 15 minutes is what's recommended. Um, this can change uh, from the scene of the accident uh, to uh, en route to the hospital. Uh, they can drop their blood pressures pretty significantly. But hypotension is usually not due to the brain injury itself. Medullary dis dysfunction is a very late finding, um, and it's usually due to uh, some sort of hemorrhagic shock. So fluid repletion is really what these people need. And the Cushing's triad, everybody likes to talk about that, um, with the hypertension, the bradycardia, and some sort of uh, respiratory irregularity. But that's also very rarely seen on the scene of a, of a trauma. This is a very late finding. This is right before they herniate and die. Um, it is pretty impressive, the actual uh, reflex, the response. But... Um, it's a very late finding. I've seen it a couple times. It's only present in 33% of, of people with very severe intracranial pressures. As always, maintain C-spine precautions. And the um, point of this lecture is really the neurologic function. So check their pupils. If one or both pupils are blown, and I underlined this, the patient is unresponsive. There are a number of reasons you can have a blown pupil, 
And what that means is you have a pupil that is very large and unreactive. Um, but if you have a neurological um, trauma that results in a blown pupil, then the patient will be unresponsive. If they're sitting there talking to you, then they could have had a traumatic mydriasis where they just had an impact to their eye and the pupil is no longer reactive. That does not mean that they have intracranial hypertension. Uh, so the, the patient will be unresponsive. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot in the literature about, well, how aggressively should you ventilate these, these individuals? Um, and over the years, um, many people have gone kind of to the far end of that. Well, you should aggressively ventilate them and hyperventilate them. And it turns out that <coughs> cerebral vasoconstriction occurs when you drive the partial pressure of um, CO2 down too low. And you can result in strokes as a result. And it's very effective. It's actually the most effective way to decrease the intracranial pressure. But going too far, you can stroke out the entire brain. So shoot for a normal rate. And if the pupils blow again, then increase it by 10%. But don't go overboard. There are a number of other things that we can do to help with the, the intracranial hypertension. But um, the key here is try to prevent secondary insults and not destroy uh, what vital brain tissue you have. Manitol, I understand, is only carried by uh, air med crews or you know, flight crews. Um, the most important aspect of this is really don't give it if they're hypotensive, hypotensive. Uh, you will experience a drop in your blood pressure when you administer it. It's an osmotic diuretic, meaning it kind of sucks water out of your body and flushes it. Um, <clears throat> so a blood pressure less than 100 is incompatible with this use. Obvious bleeding. This is where the patient initially comes hypotensive. Scalp lacerations will bleed um, profusely. Um, Obviously, there's no way to say, well, you can have a, a blood loss of a liter an hour or, or something like that. It all depends on where the lack, lack is, how large it is, but they will bleed uh, very heavily. Uh, so just apply some direct pressure to this. Um, if there's any brain matter coming out, still the, uh, the, the statement is the same. Just apply some direct pressure. Any sort of brain matter that would be coming out of a, a lacer laceration is no longer functional, and so at that point, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter. Uh, cardiac monitor, these people can't have arrhythmias. The seizure activity, um, initial seizure activity at the time of the impact is very common, um, <clears throat> and it's not necessarily going to occur again. Within the first 30 minutes, um, it may, but after that, uh, those are the seizures you have to be concerned about. So greater than five minutes and recurrent seizures need to be treated. And it's recommended that you use a benzodiazepine for that. Support the airway with a jaw thrust, since you presume that all of these individuals have a C-spine injury. And um, don't manipulate the neck. So what is the etiology? Uh, talk about children and, and adults briefly. Less than two years of age, you have to consider child abuse. It's unfortunately a very common problem. Um, a two-year-old or a toddler does not have a lot of strength to pull themselves up onto anything in which they can fall off of. I've seen a number of kids that have fallen out of windows um, that have been jumping on sofas and then subsequently fell out of a window. Um, so, you know, falls certainly do occur as well. But falls in the two to five uh, year range is the most common um, phenomenon. Above that, motor vehicles take precedence over all other etiologies. P 
Pediatrics um, have a number of different, there's not simply just small adults, apparently. Um, their skull is very soft. It's unilaminar at birth. It's very thin. Uh, diploid start forming at like four, age of four years of age. Uh, so the skull gets thicker and thicker as they grow. But their heads are very big. They're 90% that of the adult head size at the age of one and then 95 by the age of six. So they really grow into their, into their head size. Um, and as a result, there's some interesting dynamics that occur um, whenever there's a sudden deceleration. Their head doesn't stop. It keeps going, and they oftentimes get injuries uh, in the high cervical spine. Um, that is the number one reason why uh, car seats are turned backwards for the first uh, two years of life. Uh, their skull is softer, so they can get uh, fractures much easier. Um, they have open sutures, uh, which certainly helps if there is a if there is a um, a hemorrhage within the brain. They don't get as quickly pressures building up as adults do. Um, they lack their sinuses, and that has some interesting dynamics as well. I've placed a slide here, and it's a little blurry, uh, illustrating the frontal and maxillary sinus and how they develop. You're not born with sinuses for the most part. You develop them. This is at one year. This is at 20 years within the frontal sinus. And <clears throat> thus, they don't get facial fractures as easy. And I'll show another slide here in a moment that helps to illustrate that. But um, <clears throat> so your sinuses form as you age. This is an interesting um, fact that I ran across when I was doing some research, and I didn't actually know this, but the occipital frontal circumference, um, the OFC, you measure it from the frontal boss of the, of the head to the um, occipital protuberance. And that at birth is equal to the crown to rump length. That's just an illustration as to how big a head a child has. Um, and then I also, I also read on this, but I'm not sure I quite believe that. The bridging veins are easily torn, and the subarachnoid space is large. Well, I suppose that makes sense, but I'm not sure what the real significance of that is. So this is the reason why they get less mid-face and jaw injuries. Their face in proportion is a lot smaller than their frontal region, their occipital region, and thus, they typically rock forward and hit their forehead rather than their face. So their face is relatively protected. The cranial facial disproportion is the uh, distribution between the cranium and the face. And in an infant, it's an 8 to 1 ratio. As an adult, it's a 2 to 1 ratio. And so they really grow into this massive cranium that they're born with. So in adults, overall, it's motor vehicle crashes and falls. Um, <clears throat> this is data that came from 1990, uh, so, but I don't think that this has changed significantly. As the population grows, all of these things have been growing proportionally. Um, violence in various areas of the country does represent a slightly more prominent um, percentage uh, such as where I uh, did my medical school training in Richmond, Virginia. They're pretty commonly um, high on the homicide list, which is good for training, but not so good for raising a family. Um, recreational activities are also um, a very common etiology for uh, those developing head injuries. As you can see here, 1.6 million for sports and 3.8 million uh, for some sort of recreational activity. And that's data from 2003. So I'll run through some definitions just so that we're all speaking the same language and then get on to uh, some management. So you have two categories by mechanism. Closed head injury or open penetrating in injury. And for the most part, penetrating injury 
they all go to the OR. They're all operative candidates um, unless, they're, unless they expire before they get there. Closed head injury, we're going to uh, discuss uh, more heavily than penetrating injury because these are uh, more of the management enigmas. They're more difficult to figure out exactly what to do for them. Um, concussion is a very common problem. It's the most common out of this list. It's uh, the most benign out of this list, fortunately. Um, and concussion is just another name for mild traumatic brain injury. Contusion is basically a bruise on the brain. Uh, diffuse axonal injury is a shearing uh, effect um, that mainly, mainly affects the axons, the, the, the pipelines of the brain. And intracranial hemorrhage is a bleed in the brain. Much like a contusion, contusion is a bleed in the brain as well, and we'll discuss the differences between those two. So, concussion. Mild traumatic brain injury. These are individuals, and I'll show you a grading scale here in a moment, but they are not uh, profoundly affected. Their GCS is good. Um, they may or may not have any loss of consciousness. If you did any imaging on these people or took a look at their brain under a microscope, you would not see any evidence of an injury. This is a clinical diagnosis. You are at risk after um, having a concussion and you do manifest certain symptoms. Um, there is elevated glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter, after you have a concussion, and it's elevated for a period of time, and during this period of time, you are at higher risk of subsequent injury. We're going to talk about that more. Dementia pugilistica. There's a number of boxers, uh, famous boxers in the past that have de developed dementia, and it's uh, due to this phenomenon. <clears throat> the number one symptom is that of headache. Um, followed by lightheadedness. So here are the two most common grading systems for concussion. Um, the American, Cat American Academy of Neurology system seems to be um, the preferred, but they're both good in that they uh, break it down to something that's not subjective. So a mild, moderate, and severe or grades one, two, and three, and it's whether or not they sustained any loss of consciousness, um, transient confusion, or amnesia. <clears throat> and for the purposes of this talk, I don't think that we need to memorize this, and certainly it's pretty complex and um, usually worthwhile to look that up. Um, how do you take care of these people? They rest until they don't have any more symptoms. The symptoms can certainly vary based on what uh, grade they are. Grade one, uh, a mild grade one, um, they can get back to their activity as early as the same day um, based on NFL rules or in one week if you're like a, a young athlete. Um, grades three, um, like a severe grade two or a moderate grade three. And there's a whole bunch of breakdowns of individual categories. And I didn't put that in here to make it just seem overwhelmingly complex. But there are breakdowns of each grade. So a severe grade two and a, a moderate grade three, these people are recommended. You're done for the season. And quite possibly, you should be you should consider it being done with contact sports for the rest of your life. So it's a very, it's a very severe problem. <clears throat> and it's all due to this second impact syndrome. That is the time when they have the elevated uh, glutamate. They're hypermetabolic. They are in a glycolytic state. And it's roughly this phase that's 10 to 7, day, or t 7 to 10 days following the accident. If another impact occurs within that uh, time frame, they will sustain a much worse injury. 
or they could sustain an equivalent injury from a much less impact. So they're at, they're at high risk during this phase. Um, <clears throat> the prognosis of concussion is essentially a full recovery, unless they've had multiple concussions in the past or they have a subsequent event on top of this event, like in the uh, second impact syndrome. So there are a number of, and this is where the science of medicine comes in, or the, I guess, abstract part of medicine comes in. But as far as recommending who and when to return to activity, it's all based on these grades that we've um, touched base on. Most of these people will have imaging unless they have a very mild um, injury to start with. Like uh, a grade one is not recommended to have imaging, but a grade two and a three, you would image these, image these individuals. Normal imaging uh, assumes that it's a concussion. If they have any sort of finding on imaging, uh, going back to a previous slide, then that is no longer a concussion. They are subsequently a contused brain or an intracranial hemorrhage of some sort. The post-concussive syndrome is a very important phenomenon. It's very common. Uh, you can see up to 90% of uh, patients develop at least one symptom within the first month, and 40% have three symptoms or more within the third month. If it goes beyond three months, they need to be worked up with further imaging, further uh, neuropsych testing. Um, <clears throat> The symptoms are pretty wide-ranging, but as I mentioned, headache is the number one. Um, poor memory recall, nausea, just some mental slowness, um, emotional ability. The primary region that's affected seems to be the frontal and temporal cortexes. And so the emotional ability, personality changes, depression, and poor memory recall seem to be prominent features of this as a result. But this delayed reaction time may, may prove to be actually a, a pretty effective um, way to pick up these patients. So it's something, this is a paper, um, American Academy of Neurology in 2010. It's just an abstract. This is uh, currently under work. Um, they state that you can test an athlete on the sideline with a weighted bar and be able to um, know whether or not this person has sustained a clinically significant concussion. They ran through all these athletes at the University of Michigan, uh, something like 270 athletes. They tested them at their normal baseline and then they tested them throughout their season, whether it was football, gymnastics, or wrestling, after they sustained a head injury. And the average response time was about 200 milliseconds for them to catch a bar from the seated position after it had been dropped. Following the, um, the head injury, they had a 20 millisecond increase from the baseline reaction time. So from 200 to about 220. And this was uh, significant, um, although they didn't really have a lot of power in their study and it's uh, still going. Um, <clears throat> so this may be a good way that you can identify these patients and say, well, I have objective data now. You need to come out of the game. I can no longer recommend that, that you can continue to play. And this is exactly what physicians need sometimes, especially in NCAA sports or in the NFL, for example. This is, uh, the NFL is, is taking it a bit more serious um, than they had in the past. Um, this was published in December of 2009 by the commissioner. Uh, and he stated that basically this is a real problem. Um, helmets have come along a long way. Uh, they are certainly a lot better than they used to be. Um, but once a player is symptomatic from a head injury, then based on the team physician's decision, they need to come out of the game. And this is basically empowering the physicians uh, on these teams that they can pull these players out uh, for their own good. Now, 
They, they have a whole list of, of things here that essentially um, clarify the definition of a concussion. Um, but So they have come a long way. Um, in essence, that, that, that player will be out of the game if they're symptomatic. Um, and so hopefully um, they don't get caught with another injury within that secondary impact phase. So on to contusion. This is essentially a, a bruise on the brain. Um, I'm not going to talk about CTs too much, just because we don't have those pre-hospital. Um, but I will show a couple of them, just you know, to help further uh, the understanding of what uh, the injuries look like. Um, on CT, the hemorrhage does appear to be a little bit larger than what you would assume it to be. Um, based on the amount of mass effect that it has. And I'll try to touch base on that in a little bit just to explain that further. But a confusion results from the brain impacting bony prominences, um, such as the, the frontal area, uh, the temporal pole, um, the, contra, the coup contra coup phenomenon. Coup is when you, your head falls forward, your brain smacks the front of the, the bone, uh, the frontal bone, and then it goes backwards, it's like this, you know, bowl of jello. It just rocks back and forth and then it smacks against the occipital bone. Um, <clears throat> and common problems um, such, such that we talked about with um, post-concussive syndrome, attention, emotional responses, and memory recall, these are all frontal and temporal problems um, based on the impact. People at risk for this are those who bruise easily, which makes sense. Um, those on Coumadin, those with, uh, who are uh, a little bit older, um, our brain atrophies as we age, and as a result, there will be more movement within the cranium. Diffuse axonal injury is a very difficult phenomenon to understand. And essentially, within the brain, you have gray matter, you have white matter, you have the white matter that is myelinated. It's a little bit tougher, um, but they're all different densities. And so when you have a, a rotational mechanism, when your head suddenly stops, you get this shearing effect. And it's because all of the brain that is different densities travels at different speeds when it stops. And so in essence, within this region where all the axons run, all these little punctate hemorrhages that you see following the event are shearing of those axons. And this is actually a, a very common problem. When you have a patient that won't wake up, they don't have anything on their CT scan as far as like a space occupying lesion, um, a large epidural, a subdural, you know, an intracranial, I mean, I'm sorry, an intracerebral bleed. Um, this is usually the problem. And you can see some evidence of this um, with some little punctate hemorrhages on the CT scan, but MRI is really the, the way to diagnose it. Um, they have a very long course of rehabilitation. Um, they oftentimes have to learn how to do many, many things again. And they're never quite the same after having a, a diffuse axonal injury. Bleeds in the brain are named by the potential space that they fall in. Um, so you have the skin, um, the bone of the skull, here's the dura. An epidural hemorrhage is above the dura, so between the bone and the dura. A subdural hemorrhage is right underneath the dura, so between the dura and the arachnoid. A uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is within the subarachnoid space, so just below the arachnoid. And it's within the area that houses the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, so that brings in a whole complex of issues uh, as far as um, spasm of the vessels. Because all of the vessels that supply the brain with blood, all of the arteries run within the subarachnoid space. And they don't like blood. When blood surrounds those vessels, they get very irritative and they can spasm down, resulting in some strokes. And that goes into the 
uh, secondary injury uh, that we try to prevent as well. Uh, intracerebral is just going to be within the substance of the brain and intraventricular. I'll show you a picture of that here momentarily. Um, there are the, the cerebral spinal fluid is actually made deep within the brain and ventricles, and then it percolates out into this CSF space, the subarachnoid space. Um, if you have a hemorrhage within those spaces, uh, there are a number of problems that you can develop as well. So an epidural is, you can have an arterial epidural, which is commonly the uh, epidurals that are talked about. You can't have a venous epidural, but a temporal bone fracture um, results in disruption of the middle meningeal artery, um, and it can bleed profusely. Very quickly, typically these patients have a, uh, a lucid phase, and what that means is they get knocked out, they wake up, they're feeling better. There was a recent um, um, celebrity that, that had this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Tasha Richardson. And she had a skiing accident, uh, felt that she was doing better, which many of these patients do. A lot of patients are reluctant to pursue uh, emergency care. Um, and then due to this uh, lucid interval, she subsequently declined. Uh, it's a very f common phenomenon. Fortunately, these epidurals are rare. So uh, less than 0.5% of all brain hemorrhages. Um, <clears throat> but they do very well. As long as they get to the hospital quickly um, and subsequently evacuated, once this blood is removed, the underlying brain actually is quite functional, and it does great. Some of these patients will walk out of the hospital within a day, like two days. They'll be in the ICU that night. The next day, they'll be up with physical therapy. They'll go to the floor, and then they can be out, and they do awesome. Subdurals, oh, I forgot I had this slide in here. So this is a, um, a large uh, trauma craniotomy. And basically, it goes from here, um, right above the zygoma, right in front of the, about two, uh, about a centimeter or two in front of the, um, the tragus of the ear, so that you don't uh, knock out the, um, um, uh, the <clears throat> V2, uh, so the nerve that supplies the face. And uh, you come up, like in a question mark fashion, above the ear and all the way back up to midline, uh, to the forehead. Um, the bone here doesn't quite go to midline because the superior sagittal sinus is right underneath of it. If you get into that, that would be devastating. But what he's pointing at right here is a clot. This is a temporal, <clears throat> uh, it's a temporal extraaxial uh, clot. And uh, this was pressing on the brain right here. You can see that you know, and I know this from looking at brains before. It kind of has this yellowish appearance. It may be the photograph, um, but this part of the brain here appears to be a lot more red. There appears to be some blood within the subarachnoid spaces. Um, it's not necessarily a healthy looking brain, but they got, they got to this clot and they're removing it. So I just put this in here just so that you can see what, um, what that looks like. A subdural classically crosses sutures. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that this is essentially from here all the way down, and we'd call this a panhemispheric subdural. These are devastating. There's, if you draw a line from here to here, you can see that there's about um, one and a half centimeters of shift there to the contralateral side. This um, um, Occipital ventricle here is trapped, and there's some pressure pushing it through the wall of the ventricle, which is right here. This is called transependymal flow. This is a very, this patient's probably not going to survive. This underlying brain here is um, markedly affected, more so than in epidurals. Uh, so once this is removed, 
These patients don't walk out in days. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, it's a more common problem than the epidurals. 30% um, of all traumatic brain injuries. And just for fun, uh, let's go through a couple more slides of CTs. This is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is commonly where all of the uh, large vessels, the circle of Willis is right down here. Um, and you see this hyperdensity all the way through here. This is actually a very severe um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And there are a bunch of grading systems for this uh, that I won't go into because, you know, they're not clinically, well, they're pretty difficult to remember. Um, based on the uh, imaging, um, you can use these, uh, these systems to determine whether or not the person's going to be at high risk for vasospasm, which is a clamping down of the vessels when the blood gets around them and irritates them. Um, but these, these are problems that are not experienced in the pre-hospital environment. These are problems that are experienced within the, you know, the first month of hospitalization. These patients will be in an ICU for at least 28 days um, due to this vasospasm risk. And this person right here is a high-grade uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, that would be at really high risk of vasospasm. In a ventricular, these are the ventricles that I was referring to earlier. This is where the cerebral spinal fluid is made. You can see that the fluid appears dark on a CT. This uh, right here is really bright, and that's blood within the ventricle. Intracerebral hemorrhage, you can see that this person has a large uh, frontal bleed. And interestingly, this is a, a CT scan from a 23-year-old herpetologist in Brazil that got bit on the head by a, uh, a poisonous viper. And uh, there are a number of things that uh, viper poison can do to you, but also uh, give you intracerebral bleeds. Um, rather unfortunate place to be bit by a viper, I'd say. It was a two-meter snake. Um, I saw a picture of it online. It was huge, very scary. <laughs> um, but it can, uh, it can result in DIC, you become um, hypocoagulable, and uh, thus that's what this resulted from. So how do you rank a patient on scene? Um, how do you determine how sick they are and use a language that everybody else speaks? Um, this AVPU, not a big fan of. It's it just sounds kind of silly to say, personally. I much prefer the GCS scale. Um, it's very definitive. It's um, very concise. Um, it's a good way to triage these patients. Now, a lot of folks, it was designed to be used in the pre-hospital environment on the initial assessment. It was not designed to be used on a daily basis following patients in the ICU. Um, so it's a very good scale to memorize. Uh, it's a good scale to know. Um, eye opening is a, a score of four, like four eyes. Uh, motor response is a score of six, like a six-cylinder engine. I prefer to think about the uh, boxer engine, the Porsche boxer engine, but that's how I remember it. <laughs> so. <clears throat> How is it broken down? Uh, a mild head injury is 1415, so essentially a normal appearing person. They usually get one point off for confusion um, or one point off for eye opening. Um, <clears throat> but they're usually a little bit confused. They may or may not have loss of consciousness, as we already discussed with the um, concussion. So this is a mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, moderate, severe, and critical. These are much easier to kind of differentiate as far as what their management should be. I'm going to discuss the mild more than the rest because usually a critical person, they have brain coming out. You know, okay, we got to get this guy to a neurosurgical facility. Um, a mild, 
post-traumatic brain injury um, is a little bit more difficult to determine. If a patient has a focal deficit on their neurological exam, they have weakness on one side, um, they have some neglect, they don't recognize the one side of their body, something like that, they are no longer a mild. They're a moderate by definition at that point. So this is a rule that I use um, to help differentiate which patient of that mild category who comes in with a GCS of 14 or 15 who needs an extensive workup. Um, many of these people, if they can go home and be monitored um, by somebody who's trustworthy uh, to bring them back if they have any deterioration, um, they, can, they can be sent home in that sort of situation. But if they're older than 65, they have some brain atrophy. Um, they've had a couple episodes of vomiting. Um, their GCS is less than 15, two hours after the accident. So the initial trauma may cause some confusion. It, it may cause them to be um, not quite themselves, but that should not last more than two hours unless the, there is another problem. Um, and obviously, the rest of this is, I mean, if you see hemotympanum, blood underneath the tympanic membrane, they have raccoon eyes, um, bruising around the eyes, or a battle sign bruising in the postauricular area, um, or cerebral spinal fluid, clear fluid coming out of their nose or their ear. I mean, this is all obvious stuff. They need a CT scan. Um, these people need to be further investigated. Um, if you see a large, open, depressed skull fracture, well, that's no longer a mild hand injury. Those are people that have to go to the OR by definition. The medium risk um, <clears throat> is based on the mechanism and how much amnesia they have. Um, so these, this scale can be used in the pre-hospital environment as well. Are we going to drive by a level two hospital uh, to get to a trauma level one with a person that we're not sure about? Well, you can use some of these to help you dif differentiate that. The reason we have this Canadian CT rule is some of these people have intracranial bleeds. And it helps us differentiate who gets a CT scan. If one of these people um, were to go at an outside facility and were found to have a, a bleed at that point, then they can be transferred in. But they certainly can save that step. If, um, if you keep this in mind, certainly can just take that person to a trauma one center or a center with neurosurgical capabilities initially. So the key point here is, when was the accident? Was it over two hours ago? Are they still altered? How many times have they vomited? Are they continuing to vomit? Did they just vomit the once right after the impact? How old are they? What are their medical comorbidities? Are they on Coumadin? Um, do they, you know, are they on blood thinners? Um, if so, then just go ahead and take that person to a trauma one center um, within reason. If not, then they can get checked out in, in another facility. Um, <clears throat> severe TBI, very devastating injury. 60% uh, have at least one other organ system involved uh, due to the mechanism. 25% uh, require some sort of surgical intervention. Um, spine fractures are very common, especially in the cervical spine. <clears throat> So, uh, sorry, some of these uh, pictures may appear to be uh, somewhat gruesome, um, but it certainly helps to kind of solidify what you see on exam. Um, a head injury can result in proptosis, uh, so outward bulging of the eye. Uh, <clears throat> this is a patient I took care of in Richmond, Virginia. 
who sustained a gunshot wound uh, to the temporal region. Here's a picture of the battle sign and the raccoon sign. These are both signs of basilar skull fractures or skull fractures in the base of the, of the head. Um, <clears throat> all, you can also see cerebral spinal fluid running from the nose or the ear and a clot or blood behind the tympanic membrane. Uh, I tried to find a good picture of this, but they weren't really easily recognizable. <clears throat> so if you see these on scene, yeah, just bring these patients to uh, a trauma one. And due to the mechanism, they would have probably already been made a trauma one. Um, other findings, <clears throat> uh, mid-face instability uh, due to facial fractures. Um, you're not going to hear this on scene due to how noisy it is, but you can hear a brewery in the carotid or uh, a cavernous carotid fistula from the trauma. Um, that is of little utility on scene. Um, <clears throat> and in general, these are very specific findings. Um, I'm not sure how much time you really have on scene, especially with the bad trauma, when oftentimes it's, okay, ABCs, let's stabilize this person. Most importantly, um, correct any hypoxia and correct any hypotension. The rest of this stuff we can figure out later. There are a couple com uh, complications, and these are more long-term. They're not in the pre-hospital environment uh, that I'll just touch on briefly. Delayed deterioration. 15% um, of people with intracranial bleeds will deteriorate at some point during their course. Um, <clears throat> This can manifest itself in a number of ways um, and not really of a lot of utility in discussing here in this setting. Um, Post-traumatic diffuse cerebral edema, uh, also called malignant cerebral edema, is a very difficult problem to combat. Uh, this will be during their ICU stay. Um, following a traumatic brain injury, patients get a loss of cerebral vaso auto vascular autoregulation, meaning they no longer can control um, the volume of blood versus cerebral spinal fluid versus brain tissue. And so there are three things within the cranium at any given time, CSF, blood, and brain. And you want those to be in a nice homeostasis. When <clears throat> you have um, another mass, say a blood clot, um, a brain tumor, uh, you get a, a, a breakdown of this homeostasis. Um, the homeostasis is difficult to control following uh, a traumatic brain injury uh, due to this autoregulation. And so in essence, the pressures can climb and it's up to a series of algorithms that we'll touch base on here in a moment um, to try to control that. It's because of phasogenic or cytotoxic edema, and both can happen after a, a traumatic brain injury. Um, they are different. It's, uh, um, uh, that's a lecture in and of itself. So this phenomenon is uh, more common in children. <clears throat> uh, once it happens, it's very difficult to control. Um, in these patients, uh, the mortality is very high. The approach is 100%, but I'd like to think that at least one person survived from this. Um, and you go back to the basics. Try to control the ICPs, keep the cerebral perfusion pressures above 60 to maintain this uh, ratio to continue to perfuse what part of the brain is, uh, is viable. Oftentimes we need to consider when a patient comes in, <clears throat> what caused the accident in the first place? Was it a, you know, a simple motor vehicle crash? you know, uh, where just given the situation, a slick road or whatever it may be, or did the person really have an aneurysmal bleed, um, some sort of spontaneous hemorrhage in the brain that caused them to be unconscious, um, resulting in the crash. 
Uh, were they hyperglycemic? Did they have a seizure? Were they abusing some sort of drug? <coughs> um, so you need to figure out what came first. And it certainly doesn't change how uh, things on the scene are run, but it does change your perspective on the scene. Um, I always get a blood sugar, and EMS is great about this. We always have a blood sugar when these patients come in. Um, <clears throat> talk to any bystanders. Was there anybody in the car? Can you uh, state what happened preceding the event? Um, oh, yeah, well, the person, I was talking to them, and they didn't seem to be responding, and then they phoned at the mouth, and then we crashed. Well, that's, that's very, very important history. And oftentimes, that's history that can be best obtained by EMS. Was there, you know, a, a cloud of smoke that bloomed out of the car when they opened the door to get the person out? Um, was there, a, <clears throat> you know, empty beer cans in the back seat? These are things that EMS can certainly help with a great deal. And granted, on scenes like this, we'll have police, and, uh, you know, they'll be looking into things like that. But um, it helps us in taking care of the patient as well. The long-term legal aspects are irrelevant to, to a physician. Um, we just want to take the best care of the patient. So how do you assess their risk? There was a pretty good study with a very good power, a lot of patients, a lot of head trauma patients, over 7,000, in which they tried to break them down into low, moderate, and high risk. They also looked at this skull x-ray, which is... Um, Long, long time been proved irrelevant as far as not offering anything to the uh, clinical scenario of the patient. <clears throat> but they broke it down into low risk, asymptomatic patients, headache or dizziness, the two most common things from a post-concussive syndrome, no LOC, um, <clears throat> so it's only one portion of those who have a concussion. Uh, they stated that no imaging was necessary in these people, and they can be observed at home. So they're a low-grade concussion. Moderate risk, they have some loss of consciousness, some amnesia, worsening headache, so that could be you know, post-concussive. Um, <clears throat> may or may not have had a seizure. Um, by definition, they said less than two. Um, you know, children are just treated a little bit differently, a little bit more aggressive. Um, if they've had any facial fractures or questionable, questionable history surrounding the event, um, <clears throat> they would get a CT on these. If it's normal and the GCS recovers and is no longer, no lower than 14 initially, and they have a normal neurologic exam, then they could go home for observation if. Um, if there's a responsible party to watch them. High risk, all these are omitted. And depending on the level of altered mental status, if their GCS is an 8 or less, they'll go to an ICU, they'll get an ICP monitor, and they'll be intubated. If it's higher than 8, um, they're able to follow commands, um, interact, and protect their airway, uh, they'll be observed. But <clears throat> So CT scan of the head. Who needs to go to the operating room? Who doesn't? Um, anybody with an acute bleed greater than a centimeter. And this is measured in width. And this is a common uh, mistake. Um, so, for instance, if you're carrying or transporting a patient from one hospital to another um, for definitive treatment, and <clears throat> the hospital says that the patient has a subdural that's seven centimeters, well, that's erroneous. You can't have one and still be alive. Um, this is measured in width. So in looking at a CT scan, and I, I don't expect 
you know, the, the flight crews may be a lot more familiar with this, um, but if you measure it from front to back on a CT scan, that's when you could get some sort of really large number. One centimeter is a very large hemorrhage, a subdural or an epidural, whatever it may be, extra axial implies it could be one of either. Um, so if you see a really large number, it's probably not right. <clears throat> and the rest of these things we've kind of covered, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, hydrocephalus, this is um, when the, the ventricles can no longer flow appropriately. They're kind of blocked. You get a backup of fluid. Um, and subsequently, this can really increase the pressure, the intracranial pressure, substantially. Cerebral edema, uh, this can be from the initial crash. This is not malignant cerebral edema, which occurs later. Um, this, in combination with uh, blockage of the ventricular system and the size of the extraaxial hemorrhage, all three of these things combine just to make a really bad scenario as far as uh, intracranial pressure. If a person was down for a period of time, was not breathing effectively, was hypoxic, you can get loss of the gray-white differentiation. Um, you know, purposely, I didn't want to talk too much about this because it's very sp specific. It's something that we can see on the CT scan and helps us with prognosis. If this occurs, then the prognosis is very, very dim. It means that essentially a portion of the brain has been without oxygenation for more than five minutes and will not recover. Um, ICP monitoring or intracranial pressure monitoring uh, is recommended in anybody with a GCS less than eight. So a very severe head injury. Um, these patients are also intubated. Um, very commonly, they are coagulopathic as a result of their injury and need to be um, stabilized as a result of that. Um, placing any sort of monitoring device with an INR greater than 1.4 can result in a, a very large hemorrhage. Um, if they're extremely coagulopathic, there are different types of devices that you can use. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's out of the scope of this lecture, but um, these devices can certainly help dramatically in the management um, to know what works to decrease the intracoronary pressure and to know how aggressive you have to be. These are some things that we can do in the field. If you have a patient that has a head injury, you can straighten their neck. Obviously, you have inline stability. Um, they won't have a trach tie at that point, hopefully. Um, they'll have a cervical collar on. Um, in the field, recommend that they are snug uh, so that the patient can't be moving around. Once they're in the hospital and they're sedated, um, we can loosen that a little bit to allow better blood drainage, um, you know, better outflow from the brain to uh, prevent uh, venous backup. Definitely avoid the highs and lows of blood pressure, more significantly the lows because of the, uh, the risk of hypotension and uh, ultimate mortality. Um, the glucose, I wouldn't worry about that in the field as long as it's not low. Not a contributing factor to the crash initially. Um, but that's something that we have to consider in the hospital. Hypoxia, very important problem. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you're not going to have a partial pressure of oxygen, uh, but you'll have a pulse ox, and uh, you can um, base your, your judgments on that. Um, I'm not sure if we have any partial pressure ox uh, carbon dioxide monitors out in the field yet. We're starting to get those into the emergency departments, which are very helpful. Um, the recommended range is 35 to 40, so just mildly uh, low. 
Um, with other adjuncts, you can push this number lower. Um, but those are adjuncts in which you can tell if any sort of evolving infarct is occurring within the brain. Uh, so this is the reason to maintain a PCO2 essentially normal, low normal, um, <clears throat> to prevent really severe cerebral vasoconstriction and ultimate infarct. A dark, quiet room helps a lot. When the patient's entire family shows up to see them, they're lightly sedated, their ICPs are controlled with the remainder of this stuff, they can shoot up like 20 points just with the family coming in there agitating them. So um, this is impossible in scene. On the back of an ambulance, large, um, you know, you're hitting every pothole in town and uh, with the sirens. But there are a number of things that can be done. You know, just keep the neck straight with inline stabilization. Make sure the blood pressure is as normal as can be and prevent hypoxia. There are a couple tiers of um, treatment that we utilize. And it's based on um, you know, what's easily done, uh, what's a bit more aggressive, and then what's really aggressive. Not every patient gets to this stage. But just for thoroughness and uh, completeness, um, you can sedate the person heavily. Uh, this would all be done in an ICU setting. Uh, you can give an osmotic diuretic. Um, you can give 3% uh, normal saline which is a hypertonic saline that I didn't put on here. Um, <clears throat> uh, those are very effective. This is effective initially, but not on a long-term basis, uh, as opposed to uh, 3%, uh, the hypertonic saline. You can drain some CSF, put a drain into one of those ventricular systems, um, and pull off fluid as the patient's making it, um, and hyperventilate as we discussed. So it was down to 35 in the routine tier, and here it's five points lower down to 30 in the specific tier. So it's a bit more aggressive. Um, <clears throat> if you continue to have problems, then you need to figure out, is something else going on? So get more imaging. And this is when it gets really bad. Hyperventilate more. Uh, you can cool them down to uh, 30, I think it's 32 degrees, um, high-dose barbiturates. So this is essentially a barbiturate coma. Um, <clears throat> the triple H therapy is basically you push their blood pressures, you push their hemoglobin, their the hematocrit, with uh, additional blood products, um, and you tank them up. This helps to uh, perfuse the brain a bit better. Um, but all of these things in conjunction, well, with the exception of, it's usually a decompressive craniectomy, like that picture I showed earlier, or a barbiturate coma. Um, that is the ultimate endpoint. Um, once you do one of these two things, you should have control of the ICPs. Um, but occasionally it, it goes further than that. But anyhow, this, uh, this is a kind of a nice overview of how to control intracranial pressures in the setting of a, a, a bad head injury. Um, there are a number of things that you can do out in the field um, to help uh, facilitate the patient's care and... Um, I thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, um, here's my email address, or uh, con contact Russ, um, but I'd be happy to field any questions that you have. Um, otherwise, thank you. It's kind of the kiss of death. Um, so, number one, the, um, the brain is atrophied, so 
go back to <clears throat> there are bridging veins that go through uh, the subarachnoid space and through the dura that uh, are stretched as we age because of the atrophy of the brain and <clears throat> any sort of movement within the skull um, results in increased tension on those vessels. And you can see that basically this space here is really big now. So any remaining vessels that would be tenuously stretched across this space would, would then be torn. And so it just continues to get worse. It's a venous infarct. And so these are low pressure uh, vessels by definition. And, um, <clears throat> but they just continue to bleed. And they bleed at the expense of compressing the brain to the contralateral side. Um, there's so much brain compression as a result of this. And they're so difficult to um, correct. You can drain that blood, but the brain doesn't bounce back. And therein lies some of the fundamental problems as to why these patients do so poorly. The brain is, continues to be shifted over here, maybe not quite to this extent, but there's still a big space here that has to be filled. The brain's just not resilient um, uh, due to its atrophy. So I hope this was helpful. Um, it's uh, one of those <clears throat> topics that is very in-depth or not at all. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir.